This is Disha Dyer, and you're listening to the Chasing Dreams podcast with Amy J. Welcome to Chasing Dreams podcast with Amy J. Amy believes that realizing a life without regrets is achieved by taking chances, chasing your dreams, making moves, and overcoming your doubts. The Chasing Dreams podcast will help you overcome life's obstacles, believe in your potential, and inspire you to face your fears. And now here's the woman who is passionately pursuing her dreams, Amy J. Hey, Dream Chasers. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. It is the middle of March, and we are now at episode 133 of Chasing Dreams. We are going to continue our recognition of Women's History Month, bringing you some amazing women and their stories. But before we do that, I want to share that this episode is sponsored by our Patreon campaign supporters. Thanks, guys, for all your support in helping to inspire, equip, and empower people to chase their dreams. You guys can find all of our supporters over at amyj21.com slash supporters. So again, in honor and recognition of Women's History Month, I have an amazing dream chaser to introduce to you guys today. And so I'd like you guys to meet Miss Deisha Dyer. She is a speaker, writer, creative event and strategy consultant, and most notably known as the former Obama administration social secretary. The Philadelphia native became a White House intern at the age of 30 and completed a seven year tenure there that honed her expertise in event coordination, logistics, protocol and statecraft. Her story career is unconventional at best with themes of reinvention, drive and commitment to community service integrated throughout. Now, award-winning event producer, Disha has been featured in national media outlets, including, and these are just a few of them, Time, New York Times, Marie Claire, Essence, and so many others, guys. A charismatic speaker with unbridled optimism, she now shares her message of hope, hard work, and living life on your own terms with audiences across the country and around the world while running her private consulting firm. And she's a busy lady. She's on the show tonight, guys, and you're going to learn more about her and see how wonderful she is. Disha, how are you doing today? I'm doing so good, and I'm so happy to be on this podcast. Hi to everyone, and thank you for having me. You're doing well, great. You know, I didn't know your story. I was not aware of you, to be honest, guys. I don't know all my guests initially, but then we become friends and we become <laughs> partners because my sister actually learned about you and was like, Amy, Amy, Amy. Amy, you need Disha on the show for Women's History <laughs> Month. And I was like, Disha who? No offense. <laughs> was, and then I read your story. I was like, I don't know why I didn't know about this sooner. Everybody should know about Disha. You have a crazy and unconventional seems not, seems kind of light of a word in terms of yeah. your dream chase here. Yeah. You have done amazing things. And not just the fact that the Obama administration social secretary, but you are also the founder of B-Girl World. You mm-hmm. have a private mm-hmm. consulting firm. I mean, there's just so much going on. Let's, I know you guys are like, what, Amy, get, get, start somewhere. Let's start in the beginning. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well done. So mm-hmm. Disha, when you first began, did you see yourself in the White House? No, I, not at all. I didn't, I didn't see myself as, I didn't, I didn't know really who ran the White House. I just didn't think it was uh, regular folks like me. So I definitely did not ever I think until the Obamas came along, see a possibility of even being at the White House. Now, you said something interesting. Regular folks like me. You haven't had. Yeah, like, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, for instance, I thought you had to be really politically connected. Mm-hmm. Right. Or you had to come from a family that did a lot of donations to a certain, uh, you know, certain political party. Or you had to kind of be a celebrity. So I thought. You know, one of those, you know, one of those kind of things or the type of people that really went to the White House or, you know, you graduated from an Ivy League school. It just were all the requirements that I thought you needed were all the requirements that I didn't have. Did you (laughs) also think you had to be a a man? I didn't think you had to be a man, but I thought you I thought that if you had to be a if you were a woman, you had to be a very powerful woman. Mm. So you had to be you had to be ahead of something. Um, you know, whether it was ahead of a foundation or also you had to be maybe a prominent, you know, somebody's wife that was prominent, a man's wife that was prominent. Um, Prestigious, and that's I always, if you will. I always thought, 
Yeah. I mean, if that was the case, you still somehow ended up there. Can you tell us a little bit about what you wanted to do? And if this wasn't where you thought you'd land, how did we get there? So what was the initial thought? Sure. So I think that, you know, I never really gave much thought to politics. It was not really my, and growing up, we really didn't, we did, we were more of a social work family versus a politics family. Mm -hmm. So we did things kind of in the community more than we did kind of, you know, in Washington, DC or on the, on Capitol Hill, or even at our local offices in Pennsylvania, which is in Harrisburg is where our state capital is. Um, And I think that when, when Barack Obama started running for president, I honestly thought that he was, he was a very nice man. And I thought that what he was saying, it refreshed me and it invigorated me and it excited me because I had never heard someone talk about issues that I cared about in such a relatable way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really kind of started getting more into learning about, um, you know, what politics was. And if somebody like Barack Obama had the dream and hope to kind of be president, you know, maybe that meant that politics was maybe for us not regular, you know, or us regular folks. So I actually went back to college. I dropped out of college when I was 17 years old. And I went back to college when I was 29. And I went to community college of uh, Philadelphia. And when I did that, that was the year that I went a year before the presidential election. So 2007 is when I started. So when 2008 came and the president, President Obama won the election, I actually was like, I'm going to work for this man somehow. I put his picture up at my desk. It sounds creepy, but it was like a cover of a magazine. And I was like, I'm going to work for him. I don't know how. And then in 2009, I got an application for a White House internship. And I applied for the White House internship at 30 years old at this point. (laughs) And I got the internship. And so I was a fall 2009 intern. And then once I left, I went back home to Philadelphia and then they called me for a job in June of 2010. And then that started seven years at the white house. (laughs) So you did an internship. Was it paid? Mm -hmm. No, it was not paid. It was not a paid internship. And I, what I ended up doing was I was going to, when I got the internship, I went down to Washington from Philadelphia and I applied at a bunch of places like grocery stores and Starbucks and, I just figured that I would make it work somehow. And I, I got a job actually. And then um, right when I was moving down there, the, the job that I was in in Philadelphia, they actually surprised me um, with a party and the goodbye party came with enough money that they raised and that they gifted me that I didn't have to work when I was an intern, which was a, which was amazing at the time. Wait, are you serious? Yeah. That's yeah, amazing. So they, yeah, they ra- they raised money that I didn't know I was going to need. And I actually got an apartment. I was renting a room in Washington of a couple that was getting divorced and they needed to raise money for their divorce. And they were renting out their oldest child's room who was in college. But it was so cheap. It was only $400 a month. So I was like, it's only for uh, three I'm months. I'm sorry, what? It's a work. $400 yeah. a month? Yeah, but it was, in a, it was in a home of two people that were getting a divorce. So that's it was valid. That's valid. That's fine. It, it, it was it was really shut, but I but I was like I have to do what I have to do, and this is all I can afford. That was also before I knew I got the money from my current job, the job I was in. So yeah. Well, that's fantastic that these guys believed in you so much to they did. They did. to raise money like that, and then for you to take a chance and go after this internship where there's no guarantee of anything. No, at all. I mean, you didn't know how this was going to turn out or where you would be or what you were doing, did you? Not at all. (laughs) I mean, you apply for something and you, especially as competitive as a White House internship. And I had read a bunch of forums from, you know, mostly student forums that all wanted to online that all wanted to work for Barack Obama and work in this White House. And I just was thinking there is no way Like this is so competitive. And people loved him and Mrs. Obama so much and the administration and what it stood for. I just definitely did not think that I would ever get chosen, but I was like, I'm just going to try. And what's the worst that could happen? You know, I, I don't get it. And, and, you know, I just keep going to school and working, you know. So curious, and this may be of interest to people who might be interested in working um, at the White House at some point in some year, maybe not this mm-hmm. year or the next three, but whatever, <laughs> whenever. Um is was it was there a essay involved 
where you had to talk about why or something like that? There was. And so there was an actual application. And then and the application itself was just kind of asking you questions, you know, about where you're from and all that fun stuff, typical things. And then you had to provide a resume and you had to provide, um, I think it was two or three letters of recommendation, but then you had to do two essays. And one of them was if you could, one, something you were passionate about. And the other one was if you could write a letter to anyone in the administration about something that needs to change or an idea that you had or that you have for making the world better, how would you do that? And so that's, those are the, that was the actual application process. That, I mean, you must have done an amazing job with that application to show your passion and your, your dream through that. I mean, you may not have thought, Hey, I'm just going to take a shot, but you took your best shot and you get in and you've done a number of things, associate director for scheduling, uh, hotel mm-hmm. program, deputy director and deputy social director or secretary. Mm-hmm. I mean, did that just, I mean, that has to have been, those aren't all, they're very similar, but they're not the same right. job. So right. how not do you get through that? <laughs> well, I think, you know, going back to the application process, the thing was at the time I was a, a journalist, I was a hip hop journalist. And so I was writing about music um, in the Philadelphia area, hip hop music and the hip hop culture in general. And so writing to me um, came something that I loved and I enjoyed it. So writing the essays weren't the hardest part for me. I think the hardest part really, you know, was honestly putting my resume together because I didn't really have one at the mm-hmm. time. Um, it sounds crazy, but I didn't have one. And so I think that was, that was probably the hardest part for me was doing that. But back to your question about the jobs, they were definitely all different. Um, when I came into the White House, my first job was to be in charge of the interns in, in our department. And that was, I was the intern in that department at, at some point, you know, the year before. So I kind of knew a little bit about the job. And then I wanted to travel a little bit more. And so I said, well, what job will help me travel? And that, and then the job of the hotel director became available. So I was able to travel with the president and first lady and really support them and the teams and really their lodging logistics all over the world, which was amazing. Obviously staying in nice hotels and, you know, really making contacts in that world. But then I wanted to do more in the community. And I said, well, I want to kind of do more in the community with everyday people. What job is here for that? And Deputy Social Secretary really, really spoke to me and became open because it was a job that helped Mrs. Obama open up the house, the White House, to regular people. So all the events that we did, the community groups that came in, the schools that came in, everybody that came in from across the world, I got to help with. And so that was wonderful. And then when my predecessor left, I became the social secretary, which is a, is just an elevated part of being a deputy. Well, so rolling back your years, was logistics mm-hmm. something that was just second nature to you? Is this something you kind of figured out? Like, no, um, not at all. I think that I've always I've always put stuff together on my own as far as parties or dinners or things before the White House just with my friends. But I mean, that's, you know, sending an email and saying, everybody bring a dish, you know? So it wasn't like it was, um, it was something that I, that I really knew how to do, but at the white house, you know, you learn fast and you have really great support. There's not really an an error to mess up. There's a space. And so I became really good at it because not only the people around me really training me and helping me, but I knew that it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I really, there wasn't, there's not really do-overs, so you can't just, you know, say, I'm going to do this over again, and, and now we'll fix it. It was, it was kind of a one and done of not messing it up, and, I, and that's how I really learned logistics. Wow, and, and you've taken that on, and you've, you were also the special assistant to the president and the social secretary mm-hmm. at the same time. You mm-hmm. helped co-produce the BET Love and Happiness and Obama Celebration, which won. Mm-hmm. That was so fun. It won a 2017 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Mm -hmm. News Information Special. I mean, these are things where if you went back to 17-year-old Disha and told her, hey, (laughs) this is going to happen, what do you think her her reaction would have been? I mean, I probably would have laughed her out of the room, maybe (laughs) pushed her out of the room, probably pushed her more than anything else because... It just wasn't, you know, not only did I, when I was 17, I never thought we'd see 
a black first family, you know, so that alone True. would make me laugh in itself. <laughs> but then to be able to work for one and to be able to serve the country in the way that that I was able to and I was so honored to, I think that, you know, 17 year old Disha would have thought she probably wasn't good enough or perfect enough to have anything like that, to have that happen to her. Um, so I think I would have laughed at myself then. Um, but I wish I, you know, you can't see the future, you know, but I wish I, I wish I would have, you know, I would say to myself, if I had the confidence at 17, like I, like I did walking out of the white house, I probably would have finished college the first time around, you know, Mm -hmm. and I would have went for more. Um, but I just didn't, you know, so yeah. That being said, I think you're doing pretty well in, in embracing the opportunities that are coming your way now. I mean, Mm -hmm. in 2014, you co-founded B Girl World. And can you Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the motivation behind that and why you think it's so important today, assuming you think it's important today? Let me not put words in your mouth. No, I do. (laughs) (laughs) I do. And thank you so much for asking about it because B Girl World is really, really my love. And I've always been involved in the community for a number of years. Um, obviously being a black woman, I know what it's like to be a black girl. And so I've always very much focused on the demographic that I knew, not only the demographic that I, that I know and knew, but the one that I feel needs me the most and where I could be most beneficial and B girl world. We started it with me and my um, co-founder, which is Marcella. She's a really great friend of mine um, because we both love to travel and we, both did not have that opportunity when we were younger, whether, you know, to really travel and explore it as a, a career or explore a study abroad. We both didn't do that. So I started looking kind of at study abroad numbers and noticing that there's a really lack of Black students that study abroad, but even more so Black females. And then as I worked for President and Mrs. Obama, I realized also that um, in embassies around the world, there's a lack of Black U.S. diplomats. So those are people who are from the country and then they go work in embassies representing the United States and doing public diplomacy. And I was like, this is very off somewhere. So maybe I can, you know, we could start this program that teaches girls about travel and empowers and elevates them through travel. So we teach them about study abroad. We teach them about foreign service. We teach them about public diplomacy. We teach them about just, you know, taking a regular job and perhaps making it a global job. But we also teach them about, you know, learning to, to see and experience other surroundings and not just like you have to go to Morocco or Barcelona. If you're in Philadelphia, you can go to North Carolina and that's still traveling and that's still seeing the world outside of yourself and outside of your block. So last, last year, 2016, actually two years ago at this point, we took our first international trip to Paris and London. We got all the girls passports. We just announced that our new class, we work with high school girls that are juniors or that are freshmen and sophomores. We're taking them to Quebec city in May. Um, And we really hope that they, you know, some of them have gone on to college. Now they're applying to study abroad and we're super excited about just being able to show them the world and, and let them know that they are part of the world and that they deserve to represent um, themselves wherever they go. How many girls are in one class typically? So we do 12 girls in each class and a class is every two years and it's because of um, because money, right? So we would love to do more if we had more money, but we, we don't, but it's okay. Cause they, they go through a two year process. So the first class started 2014, ended in 2016 with a trip to London and Paris. And then this class just started in 2017 and they'll go on a trip in two, like a big trip in two years, or they were going to Canada, um, which is still a big trip for us this year. But what we do is all year round, we have different um, events and different things for all girls. So we have passport parties, we have movie screenings, we have panels, we have um, different things that we're launching still coming up. So we do different things all year round for all Philly girls that can attend. But our B-Girl World classes are for specific 12. And so this is amazing. How do you decide where you're going? Do you take a poll amongst the girls and try to work that out? Or do you have something in mind before the classes begin? Now, girl, listen, if we sat there, we asked these girls, listen, if we asked these girls, we asked them, we do for fun. Part of their application is like, tell us your dream place. And it's like Fiji and Japan. And I'm like, every place, Abu Dhabi, every place you put is like ridiculously off the meter, expensive, right? 
So we're like, okay, <laughs> we take that into consideration, but most likely we're not going there. So um, how we decided last time is that we had um, friends. I had friends that live in London and also we had friends in Paris. And so we um, were able to figure out a way to stay economically. Um, we were able to go visit both embassies. And so we went to go to the U.S. Embassy in London and Paris. I had friends at both embassies um, that really let, you know, gave the girls tours, sat down and talked to them about diplomacy, what they do there, how they got there. And we were able to get a really great also flight. Um, you know, for us, we really look at what's economical, but also what's beneficial for the girls. You know, what's a country that will welcome them? Where's a place they can see different people? You know, we don't want to take them to, you know, somewhere that people that look just like them sometimes because we want them to experience different things. We would love for them to just go everywhere, but we have a limited budget. And the first thing we do too with the classes is that we do something called discovering yourself. So they we went to the um, the national, the Smithsonian African American Museum. They learned about themselves. They did DNA tests. They learned about the history of Philadelphia. So we want them to also see their heritage and learn about themselves before they go discovering the world. That's amazing. I mean, you. you are doing some amazing work, giving back and helping them foster a belief in themselves and in the those around you. I mean, the positivity you're shining here is just off the charts. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when you first started this, was it, is it going how you pictured it? Is there something more you want to do with B-Girl World? That's hilarious. No, it is not. So, so I think that, <laughs> I think that, no. So I think that this is the thing is we're in a world right now where there's a lot of needs, right? There's a need that there's education and there's food security and there's housing and there's the opiate crisis and there's mass incarceration. There's lots of issues that are going on. So when you tell people that you have a girls program that teaches them about travel and elevates and empowers through travel, people are like, really? Like they don't see it. They don't see it as a need against some of the other things like education or fair uh, housing or criminal justice reform. So we thought that everyone would have our same exact passion, that everyone would just be like, this is amazing. Here's 12 plane tickets to go wherever, or here's this. And we had to realize in our first year that that wasn't really the case, that we really had to make a good argument for how travel and being independent and, and seeing the world and seeing the world outside of yourself really, really shaped, can shape a character of a girl. And so we had to really form that, that, that thinking in order to then go ask for money. Um, I think that, you know, other things we have met, you know, we wanted everybody, we want all the girls to have passports. We were able to supply passports for all of them and some of their parents, right? Um, we were able to go on an international trip. We were able to go ahead and go to embassies. So some of the things did come true and we are very thankful, but we also know that, you know, we have to compete for money and, and all those other things, with other organizations, but that's also a good problem to have because so many people are out here doing good. Um, but it's, it, but it, it, so I'd say 50-50 going how I thought it would go, um, but I'm happy to be doing it and I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's, it's definitely my calling. Well, that's interesting that you say it that way, because I, I think, you know, when you say it, it was funny that people in comparison to homelessness in domestic violence mm -hmm. in all those right. things that you mentioned, right? Um, I'm not, I'm with you. I, I don't, it's not that the, those aren't needs. No one's saying that. Right. But I mm -hmm. do see that this is also a need and, you know, a specific need and one that is important to help foster young women and mm -hmm. young African-American women in what they want to do mm -hmm. and, and help. The, and programs like that and like the Meyerhoff Scholarship Program who help foster diversity and in higher education, you know, those programs are needed. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. again, not saying that anything else isn't needed, guys. But, you know, programs like this, I'm saying this because if somebody comes to you and says, hey, somebody else is doing some program just because they're, they're working on this doesn't mean they don't care about something else. The nice thing about life and pe being human, you can do more than one thing. Exactly. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And that's, and that's exactly what we try to show is, you know, for us, we want the girls to know that they could do anything, that their, their, their possibilities are endless. And that's because 
they can they can leave the borders. They can leave the borders if they want to, or they can stay inside the borders. You know, we don't we don't want to travel shame, you know, and say you have to go take these beautiful pictures off the coast of France, you know. We don't want people to feel like you have to do that in order to to be considered a traveler. But we really want to foster and we really want them to see, you know, other African American women that are traveling like that. There's so many great examples now, but in twenty fourteen and even before that there really wasn't a lot of examples that we could point to for them. Um, and so, you know, and I love what we do because the girls are sick. They are so excited and they're so close and they just want to go on all these trips and they want to learn different languages and listen to people talk. And that excites me, you know? So yeah, it's great. What is one thing that in your classes, in the applications you get a common thing that these girls struggle with that you helped address? I think a lot of them, that's a great question too. A lot of them are from different schools. And so we don't really get girls that go, we get girls from all over the city who, you know, whoever applies. So we put the application out for everyone. And a lot of them seem, I'd say about half and half, a lot of them are pretty shy. So a lot of their parents say, we want this program to help them find their voice, to help them meet other women that they would, young girls, they would not normally meet because they don't go to the same school. They're not in the same dance program. So we really get a lot of young girls that are really just shy and they're just quiet and they haven't found their voice yet. But the interesting thing is like our new class that we have, they're so close and, you know, they have a group chat and then they take pictures of each other and Snapchat and they really get along really great. And so they're finding, they're fostering their own little travel squad, which is so great. So I find a lot of them struggle with just being accepted in their own neighborhoods or with their schools and they meet these new group of girls. Right. And they're just like a new friend. And all of a sudden they have like a, they have a voice and they have these new friendships and they can really have leadership skills they haven't done before. For instance, we have one girl who's, who's really shy and her parent was like, you know, she's so, I want this to bring something out in her. And even in her interview, she was very quiet and she's like one of our biggest leaders. Like, you know, she, you know, takes all the photos and she set up the Snapchat and she does this video a lot. It's just like, whoa, you know? Um, and so, you know, we foster that in her. And so she's like our picture taker, you know, and our video person. And we're hoping those skills also for her transfer when she goes to college, you know? So, yeah. So this is, this is why I really loved your story and what you're doing with B girl world, with what you're doing in the community. It's because, you know, in the 130 some interviews I've done, one of the common things I find is that as people are older in their adolescence, young adults, confidence in themselves seems to be Mm -hmm. what's lacking. You know, Mm -hmm. they, they doubt Mm -hmm. themselves. They only focus on the negative. These are things that are kind of like holding them back from chasing their own dream and being happy, so to speak. And it seems like what you're doing is you're getting ahead of the problem, you know, and and something as simple as teaching these girls what you are, um, just using the example of the um, girl you were speaking of, fostering that that confidence in them and helping them shine their their light in their own way and how close they grow. That's going to help them in chasing their dream. And I love that. I love that because it also means Mm -hmm. they will be positive, great examples for others. They will be representation for the next generation. And it seems like we're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's true. And I think that, you know, it's it's not enough almost for us to say to a young girl, like, believe in yourself, be strong, whatever. Like, they keep hearing that. But with, with us, what we do is, for instance, the girl I was just speaking of, she's really good at multimedia. She's really good at care. So we really take the skill that she has and we empower her through that. You know, it's just like, you are so, you're go, so good at this. Like, that photo looks amazing. So she feels like what something that she has to offer is also valuable. And in change, that also helps her. You know, we just say like, you know, you're amazing just on her own. She can remember that she also has these, these skills and that, you know, that she's naturally gifted, just how she is with a natural talent. And so we really also try to make them feel very useful. And it really, it really works, you know, because they just, they're all so happy. <laughs> they're really happy girls. <laughs> And so is this the only thing you're doing right now? B-Girl World? Is that what your focus is? What else do you have going on? That, that is where my focus is, but B-Girl World does not pay any bills. So to be honest, so I actually am doing a bunch of consulting for a couple 
Um, I have a couple clients that I'm doing some event consulting, um, but I also make money um, being a speaker. So I speak a lot about my journey. Um, I speak a lot about confidence, imposter syndrome, that it's okay to change. It's okay to start over. So th- those are the three things I do is basically be girl world. I do my consulting with a couple clients that I have. And then I speak and I, I love talking, as you can see. So, you know, I love talking and interacting with people and just getting to know people and listening to their stories. I love to hear people's stories because I, I still get very inspired as well from people. So it's interesting. One of your topics that you mentioned was imposter syndrome. Did you can you explain what that is? And did you suffer from that yourself? Yes. So <laughs> imposter syndrome is when you feel when you accomplish something, but you feel like a fraud, like everyone's going to find out that maybe you're not as qualified as they thought. And it was a mistake. So, for instance, like, you know, getting the White House internship, I was you know, I always thought, yes, I accomplished this, but like they're going to find out any minute now that I'm not as good as I I, 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 they thought I was in the beginning. And so it's like, I'm, I'm basically being an imposter. Like, you know, I'm being somebody else. And so that's what I, that's what imposter syndrome is. And you think that, you know, you think that they're going to, people are going to find out that you're just an imposter. You're not that great. And so that really works on your confidence. And so for me, I'm work. you know, I teach people how to beat imposter syndrome because we, a lot of us have it. It's just like, you've accomplished this great thing. And you're like, but it's not really, it's not a big deal. Like, no. Or you think somebody's going to be like, she's not really that smart, you know? So, and you start to internalize that and that starts to affect how you feel about yourself. Um, So that's what imposter syndrome is. It's feeling like a fraud for accomplishing good things. And so I just want to be clear. You feel that you are a regular person. Oh, I am beyond regular. Like, yes, I am very regular. (laughs) So you are a regular person who has had some amazing experiences, has founded, was a part of the White House and Obama administration doing many different things. And mm-hmm. you not only did that, but you founded uh, Be Girl World and are giving back, ta- having talks, traveling internationally. Is that all as a regular person? I think so. I think I'm an ordinary okay. person that does huh. extraordinary things. See, and that, I think that, I love how you just said that. Yeah, that's what I think it is. I think that, if I'm not, you know, people see me in magazines and, and they, they, then they meet me and they're like, oh my goodness, you're so regular. You're like, we thought that you were <laughs> going to be a snob or we thought that you were going to be like, you know, so high on your horse and like the way you hold your napkin and your cup. And, and I'm like, what? I'm like, <laughs> I'm an ordinary person who's done extraordinary things. And we all have, not just me, but we all have, you know? So yes, I worked at the White House, but some people, they, this, some people franchise you know, 10 Annie and pretzels. Like, that's amazing. You own, you know, so I don't ever look at it like, you know, I definitely am, extra, I have done extraordinary things, but most of us have, but we measure our accomplishments against someone else. And if you do that, you're never going to, you're never going to measure up. Like, I can't measure my accomplishments against Oprah. Like, I'm not going to measure up. It's not the same, but I, but I feel good about what I've done and I feel good about where I'm going. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's, I, uh, you know what, I'm going to stop because I can't say anything better than that. That's, <laughs> yes. So let me, before I let you go back to your, back to yeah. your evening, what is something that as an ordinary person, you would tell another ordinary person who wants to chase their dreams? What would you tell them today? I would tell them that be kind to yourself and extend grace to yourself. Allow yourself to change. Your dreams are going to change as you change. So you may have a dream at 17 that you don't have at 25 anymore. And that's okay. It's okay for your dreams to change. And it's also okay to take baby steps in those dreams. You're not going to go, I didn't go from like, you know, college dropout straight to this, you know, special assistant to the president. You know, I started out, you know, as a, as a staffer and as an intern, actually an unpaid intern. And I had to work my way up to that. So I would say, be kind to yourself during this process. Because the process is never straightforward. And it's okay that it's not straightforward. Because while you're veering off, chasing this dream, a new dream may come. <laughs> and, and you're like, oh, I didn't even realize that I was interested in that or I wanted that. And then I would say, like, don't get frustrated if it doesn't happen overnight. And don't compare yourself to people that it looks like it, for them it happened overnight because it probably didn't. You know, we see people's highlight reels on social media. We don't see the whole film. 
So that's really important for us to remember. And just what's the, what's the worst that could happen if you chase them and it doesn't work out? You know, you're going to be okay. And knowing that you're going to be okay, I think is really important. But knowing that you also have the confidence to go after your dreams is also very important. What she said. <laughs> all of that, I guys. Like, I don't know. Should I say more? Should I say more? No, all of that. <laughs> yeah. All of that. You don't need the bag of chips. Just all of that. All yeah. of that. <laughs> just take all of that. Deesha, thank you so much for, for taking the time to come on the show and just no, sharing thank, everything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for having this podcast to inspire people to, to just listen and learn. And hopefully, you know, I, people can always like reach out to me, always comment on my Twitter or whatever. Um, I'm very responsive because I'm a regular person. Um, so <laughs> feel free, like, you know, to reach out. I, I am very reachable. So thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. So guys, that was Disha Dyer. How amazing is her journey? Incredible, right? And she's not wrong. Uh, you know, if you guys need to go to the show notes and check out, re-listen to this episode because she was dropping knowledge left and right, left and right, up and down, left and right. It was all over. Okay. From beginning to end, I could put out a number of clips just with the knowledge she was dropping. Okay. So you guys can learn more about Disha and Be Girl World and everything she's doing and find all the links we mentioned today over at amyj21.com slash episode 133. That's episode 133. Now, thank you once again to our Patreon sponsors. It's a big help for us putting out these shows, helping to be inspiring as much as we can. If you guys want to learn more about the Patreon campaign, there are rewards. We do give things back. We're having the Where Are They Now podcast episodes released only to our Patreon sponsors at the moment, hope to get it as a podcast later on. But for now, it's it's exclusive to Patreon donors. Check it out if you can. And if you can afford to, we'd love your support. Even a dollar goes a long way for everything. So thank you again to the Patreon sponsors. And you can find out more information over at amyj21.com slash Patreon. And that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. All right. Till next time, guys. Keep chasing. Thank you so much for listening to Chasing Dreams. Amy would love to connect with you and hear all about your pursuit of chasing your dreams. Connect with her on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram via at Chasing Dreams HQ. Or you can find Amy on Twitter at AmyJ21. That's A-I-M-E-E-J-2-1. Be sure to visit headquarters over at chasingdreamshq.com for more inspiration, motivation, and resources to help with your own dream chase. We hope you'll join Amy next week. And until then, keep chasing.